episode of the Dr. Perkins Podcast. So today we're going to be talking about cells. So, uh, one of the things you got with your cell is you have your cell membrane. Uh, and so we're going to draw this huge cell right here. And this right here is your cell membrane. And so this controls what is allowed to go into and out of the cell. All right. Uh, next structure that we got is nucleus. Now, if I were to draw this to scale, uh, it would take up half the cell right here. Uh, but for the sake of space, I'm actually going to draw my nucleus a lot smaller right here. Um, and so here's my nucleus. Uh, and so this is going to house the cell's DNA. And so if you were to look inside of this nucleus, you got the squiggle stuff right here. Uh, and this is going to be your chromatin. And so this is your DNA and protein. And that's really going to allow the DNA to pack down in there, right? Uh, if it's just DNA, DNA itself is negative. So a bunch of negatives aren't going to want to hang out with each other. And so we have that um, protein that allows the DNA to really kind of cram it together. And so a lot of this protein is made of histones, which is positively charged. Well, positives and negatives attract. All right. So next thing you're going to do is in the center of your cell, I'm going to draw this dark spot right here. And that dark spot is your nucleolus. Right. Um, and the reason what's going on here is we're actually reading the DNA and we're making something called mRNA. So your mRNA, this is short for messenger RNA. And so this is the message from the nucleus to the cell. Hey, this is the protein that we're looking at making right here. All right. Uh, so the next structure we're going to do is we're going to put uh, little dots on our mRNA. And so these are ribosomes. And so ribosomes read the mRNA. Well, why are they reading the mRNA? So what's going to happen is we got this mRNA, but what does it mean? I don't know, right? And so the ribosomes, their job is to make sense of this messenger uh, mRNA. And so this is what's actually allowing us to be able to make proteins. So DNA to DNA is replication, right? DNA to RNA is transcription, right? If you go to uh, some country where you didn't know the language, you might be able to copy exactly what was written, but you have no idea what that means. And so what you need to do is translation. So when you go from mRNA to protein, that's translation. And that's what those ribosomes do. Okay. Um, so the next structure that we're going to do, um, fortunately, you're going to see uh, the limitations of my art skills right here. And so, you know, we're going to kind of do like a pancake-like structure right here. And this is going to be your endoplasmic reticulum. All right. And so with the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, this is like the general motors of the cell. So the cell is making a bunch of stuff that it's going to be using for export. Uh, you know, different cells will play kind of different roles in it. Uh, one of the big things, for example, uh, if you go out and drink a lot of alcohol, you get a beer belly. All right. Why is that? Well, what happens is the smooth and glass particular detoxifies drugs, particular alcohol. So if you go out and run it, woo, time to make some bad choices, right? Uh, your smooth and glass reticulum is going to get extra big because your liver says poison, poison, right? And so it's going to be better at chopping up that poison, getting rid of that alcohol. And so the smooth and glass reticulum gets bigger with the liver. Well, if the uh, smooth and glass reticulum is getting bigger, the liver cells are getting bigger. 
As the liver cells get bigger, the liver gets bigger. All right. Your muscles, your smooth and advised reticulum, also stores calcium. And so we'll release a bunch of calcium, which will cause your muscles to contract. Now, uh, the next structure that we're going to have is I'm going to put these same dots that I use for my mRNA over here, right here, right? Remember those dots that were on my mRNA, right? Those are my ribosomes, allow me to read my proteins, uh, read my mRNA and make proteins. Well, guess what? If I have dots, if I have those same ribosomes on my endoplasmic particulum, I call this my rough endoplasmic particulum. And so this is important for making proteins for export. All right. Uh, so next thing that we got right here. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, this is some of my limitations in terms of art skills. So this is going to look kind of a lot of the same way. Unfortunately, it looks a, uh, a little bit different in ideal circumstances. And so this is going to be the Golgi apparatus. Golgi apparatus. And I like this to the Amazon of the cell. Not the Amazon rainforest or the Amazon river, but Amazon.com, right? So Amazon really doesn't make anything. Well, then why does everybody shop at Amazon? Because Amazon does a wonderful job of shipping and receiving, right? Um, and so that's exactly Golgi apparatus does. It gets things out of the cell and it gets things into the cell. And so great job there. Now, one of the handy dandy features on Amazon is at Christmas time or somebody's birthday, right? Uh, what you could do is say, hey, I want you to gift wrap my present, right? Uh, well, this Golgi apparatus can gift wrap proteins. And so, hey, uh, I'm going to have this protein. Uh, I'm going to put a gift wrap with the carb gift wrap it with the fat, right? Um, and so that's very helpful, right? That's part of a process called post-translational modification, right? Is that That's when you're gift wrapping a protein, when you're putting a fat or sugar on it and stuff like that. Okay. Um, and so one of the things is you see a lot of stuff going on with the cell, right? Uh, we're pulling things out, we're pushing things out, we're making proteins, uh, manufacturing, all sorts of different things. Where are we getting the energy for all this stuff? Well, your next structure is going to look like a loaf of Panera bread right here. Uh, and so, right here, here's my loaf of Panera bread. Uh, and these are your peroxisomes. Right? So a couple of things. I'm sorry, not your peroxisomes. Uh, these are going to be your mitochondria. So for those of you that, like, yeah, he was talking about the proxisomes. Uh, we failed my pop quiz. Uh, these are actually mitochondria. So one of the big things I like to mention about the mitochondria is uh, where do you guys get your power from, right? So some of you guys do. Some of you guys get it from uh, United Energy, whatever, right? Uh, but does Duke make energy? No, it does not. So why are we paying them? Well, because what they do is they take pieces of coal, natural gas, uh, whatever, and they suck the energy out of that and they put it into a form that we can use, right? You can't take uh, gasoline and try to get your computer to work. Not going to work so well, right? Uh, same thing with our body, right? If we were to use sugar, you know, we're not going to be able to power chemical reactions. If we were to use fat, we wouldn't be able to power chemical Reactions. So what the mitochondria does is it helps suck the energy out of that sugar, fat, and protein and turn it into something that we can use. Mitochondria. I'm sorry, uh, ATP, right? Well, uh, you know, we can break down some uh, sugar without the mitochondria, but we don't do a very good job. Uh, you know, we easily need uh, 16 to 17 times the amount of sugar uh, to get the same amount of energy uh, out of the sugar if we uh, if we don't have mitochondria versus we do. Uh, now, the other thing is that mitochondria has a role in cell suicide, also known as apoptosis, right? Uh, and so this is very important in a subject called cancer, right? So one of the things, if you have cancer, uh, 
Off times a self destruct sequence will get activated. I'm sorry, you made one too many mistakes, uh, Mr. Cancer Cell. You need to commit suicide, right? And the cell will literally kill itself. Well, if you're cancer, that, that's not a good idea, right? Uh, you know, it's a wonderful idea for the body, not so much for the cancer, right? Uh, so a lot of cancer cells will stop making mitochondria, get rid of mitochondria. Well, now, how does the cancer cell get its energy? Well, it needs to, to break down a lot of sugar. Why? Because it can't use fat, and it can't use protein, and then the sugar, it's not doing as good of a job getting the energy out of the sugar, so it's going to need a lot more sugar to get the same amount of energy right there. And so cancer cells will use a lot more sugar. And that's one of the things that's noted is the higher your blood sugar, the more likely you are to get cancer. And when you do get cancer, it's a lot more aggressive. Why? You're giving the cancer the energy that it needs. All right. Uh, now, one of the big things that you also run into is you have some organelles that they're all gonna that they're gonna look exactly like each other because this is a functional difference, not so much a structural difference. And so you're just gonna do like a circle here, and this is your uh, peroxide zones. Now, this sounds like peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, and that's not by accident. Peroxidomes make hydrogen peroxide. Now, this has two roles. Number one, it helps us kill germs, right? You think when you get a cut on your arm, you put hydrogen peroxide to help kill the germs. Same idea here. The hydrogen peroxide it will actually help us make a really strong chemical, uh, you know, in addition to the hydrogen peroxide. So it helps us actually make bleach and hydrogen peroxide to kill off germs. Uh, the other thing that peroxisomes do is they have a role in the breaking down of fat right here. All right. Uh, next structure is going to look suspiciously like peroxisomes. Uh, and that's not by accident. That's not a limitation to me. Uh, that's just reality, right? This is a functional difference, not so much a structural one. All right. And this is your liso. Zones. And so this sounds like Lysol, right? Uh, Lysol kills germs. Lysosome also kills germs. Now, lysosomes are the garbage man of the cell, right? We got all the stuff going down. Well, guess what? Sooner or later, stuff breaks down. We don't need as much anymore. And so we use lysosomes to get rid of this stuff. Uh, we can, uh, bacteria will even use lysosomes to gobble up their food and break it down, right? Uh, in humans, our white blood cells will gobble up the bacteria and use lysosomes to break it down. Uh, an example uh, of this would be tuberculosis, right? We actually uh, gobble up the bacteria and we use our lysosome to destroy it. But the bacteria, the tuberculosis says, look, that's not a good plan for me. I'm going to stop your lysosome from working, from actually uh, releasing its content from it. And so, unfortunately, that can make for a very serious infection here. All right. Uh, next thing we got is vascules or vesicles. So, vesicles and vascules are basically cellular bags, right? And so, when we need to put something in a little bag, we can use a vesicle or vacuum. Vacuoles are just bigger versions, more or less, of vesicles right here. Uh, okay, so next thing we got right here is we're going to just kind of like do a little dot over here. I'm going to, uh, a little kind of dot right here. And uh, this is an inclusion body. Uh, and so sometimes we don't need to put things in back. So we could just have it free floating within our cell. Uh, and that's going to be an inclusion body. And so it kind of clumps the stuff within our cells. Uh, next thing we have is our cell will typically have some sort of shape, right? So this is a fairly simple cell, it doesn't have too complicated of a shape, but you have some, like neuron, it's really branched and everything else, and so that neuron has to be connected, uh, with, uh, a thousand different neurons, some places will have different numbers, uh, but how does the neuron just keep its shape and keep all the little connections that it has? Well, it needs to have a skeleton. It needs to have a backbone. And so that is what your cytoskeleton is all about. Giving the cell its shape. All right. 
And so next thing I'm going to do is draw two kind of asterisks, kind of stars right here. Uh, and so each one of these is a century old, right? And so a century old, uh, it takes two of them to uh, make up your uh, century zone. And so this is going to be the center of the cider skeleton right here. This is what the cider skeleton is tying into. And this is going to have a role during cell reproduction, right? The uh, central zone is going to split. The central rolls are going to move to opposite sides of the cells. And it's going to pull these chromosomes apart and everything else. Um, and so that's kind of what you got right here. Uh, next thing we got is going to be our basically our channels right here. And so we got little channels here or uh, and so this is going to help with the skeleton we'll, uh, with entry and exit right here. So for example, you might have a sodium channel. Now the sodium is allowed to come in if there's a receptor there, or vice versa, right? Uh, you know, we also have surface proteins right here uh, that are receptors. And so what will happen is a molecule will bind here and will signal the cell, hey, look, you need to do this or that or the other. All right. Uh, and so another thing is you got cell adhesion molecules, so CAM, all right? And that's going to help the cells kind of glue together, right? And so I don't want my skin from my hand just falling off right here. And so I have a cell adhesion molecule that's going to glue my skin molecules together, right? Um, you know, you can also have some things like self markers uh, and so on. And so this cell telling other cells, hey, I've got skin cell, right? But we can also have markers that tell the immune system kind of what we're up to. And so these surface proteins really do have a, a big role in telling a lot of different things what's going on here. All right, next thing we're going to do is on our cell, we're going to put uh, some hair right here. Uh, this is cilia, and it helps move substances along the surface of the cell, right? So if you're a smoker, right, uh, nobody sleeps both. <sighs> Right, it's like a cigarette while they're sleeping. Uh, no, that doesn't happen typically. Uh, and so when you wake up, it's been about eight hours since your last cigarette. And so one of the things that happens with cigarette uh, smoke, they actually have chemicals that numb the cilia and they kind of paralyze. It. Why? Because if you want to smoke, <laughs> all right, how long have you been smoking for? Oh, about 20 years. Yeah, that's not going to be very popular here. Um, and so numb the cilia, um, you know, now you can, <sighs> nothing like a cigarette to calm the nerves, right? Why? Because we've shut the cilia down. Well, what happens is when it's been, we wake up in the morning, it's been eight hours since your last cigarette, uh, your lungs are like, oh my goodness, what the heck is going on? Why are we so filled with soot? Right? And so the cilia are getting activated and moving all that soot out of the lungs. Uh, and so you start, <coughs> right, you're bringing all this junk up. Uh, so if you're dying of pneumonia uh, and you're a smoker, a lot of times what they do is they give you a patch of uh, nicoderm and they don't allow you to smoke at the hospital, right? And so a lot of patients, they don't fully understand, oh, this is just stupid. Look, I'm going to smoke the second I leave the building. Okay. Uh, but you know what? Good news, even if that's all you do, you're way more likely to leave the building if you don't smoke. Uh, because we've got the cilia, they're bringing up all the germs that are trying to kill you out of your lungs. And so you're way more likely to get better and recover from your pneumonia than if you just keep smoking while you're in the hospital. Okay, uh, other structure right here is going to be this long hair right here. And this is flagella. And so this flagella is going to help cells kind of swim. So pretty much sperm are the only ones that have this in human cells. So the sperm is able to swim kind of like that and able to get you pregnant uh, if you're a female. All right. Uh, next thing you notice is we have some blank space right here, right? Uh, and so this blank space is your cytosol, right? This is 
uh, your liquid part of your style right here. All right. Um, now, the, everything I've been covering so far, all these structures I've been drawing are organelles, the little organs of the cell, right? And so cytosol plus organelles, um, this is going to make your cytoplasm, right? Uh, and so cytoplasm is pretty much everything from the cell membrane, also the plasma membrane, to the nuclear membrane. So everything in between these two spaces is going to be cytoplasm. So let's see what you learn. So you have a patient with type 2 diabetes. What is the problem on the cell? Which part of the cell is having an issue? All right. Uh, so what one of the answers is, is you're going to have a problem with the channels right here. And so what happens is glucose wants to get inside of the cell, but it can't because the glucose receptor is having an issue, right? And so without the glucose receptor, you can't get into the cell. So the glucose is going to be stuck outside the cell. All right. So next question here. Um, all right. So you have a person whose body is rapidly creating new proteins. Which organelles would you expect to see more of? What changes would you expect to see inside the cell? Give you a second to think about it. Okay, so the answer is you're going to see the nucleolus is going to be bigger. Why? Because I'm creating more mRNA, right? Now you're not going to be able to see the mRNA, but you're also are going to probably see more ribosomes inside the uh, cytoplasm right there. The endoplasmic reticulum for making this protein for export uh, is going to be enlarged, particularly the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and so that's what you'd expect to see there. All right. So next question here. You have a patient with a genetic disorder. Um, and so what are you seeing in this person? Their, their brain is filled up with fat. They're having problems with myelin. This is a fatty substance that allows your brain cells to be able to talk to each other up to 10 times faster. Um, their, their adrenal glands are uh, failing. They're filled up with fat. Uh, so which of these organelles is malfunctioning? Give your second to think about that. All right, um, so the answer is a couple of things that's going on. Number one, the nucleus has that genetic information, right? So anytime we have a genetic disorder, the nucleus is to blame because the DNA is going to be messed up there. All right, um, now in this exact situation, we notice we're having problems with fat, 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 right? What organelle processes fat? All right, that's going to be your peroxisomes, right? So they're going to have a problem there. All right. Um, what else could we ask about this? All right. Um, let's say you have a patient that they're frequently getting sick. Uh, and when they get sick, they seem to have a hard time clearing infections. Which of these organelles do you think might be malfunctioning? I'll give you a little bit of time to think about it. All right, so the answer is going to be the lysosome, right? And so the lysosomes, right, you think of lysol. One of the things that we do with these is we use them to digest things, right? And so our white blood cells, we use these to digest bacteria. And so this is malfunctioning. Um, you know, the thing is we're being exposed to germs all the time. And so the lysosome is going to gobble up these germs before they even make us sick a lot of times. But if they're malfunctioning, not only is it failing to do that, now it's able to grow out of control, get you sick. And so you're going to get a lot sicker and stay a lot sicker a lot longer. And that's going to happen more frequently as well. Okay. Um, let's see what you got here. Okay. Um, you have, you know, you're concerned about your daughter. So you take her to the pediatrician who does uh, a biopsy after discovering a mast on your daughter's ovaries uh, 
Now, in the mask, you see an enlargement of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. What do you think is going on with your daughter? Give you a little bit of time to think about it. All right. So the answer is going to be uh, she could pro she's either going through puberty or that mass is producing uh, estrogen, progesterone, maybe an androgen, right? So some sort of uh, steroid is being produced. Why? Because the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, right? The endoplasmic reticulum is the manufacturing center of the cell, right? Well, if I don't have ribosomes, I cannot make proteins. So whatever that mass is, it's not cranking out lots and lots of protein. Right? Um, and so the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is going to be cranking out lots of hormones, uh, particularly if it's in the ovaries right there. Now, if we had done that same surgery, but we found it on the liver, well, the liver's not known for making lots of hormones. So why would the liver smooth endoplasmic reticulum be enlarged? Because that liver is working very hard at detoxifying drugs right there. Um, let's see what else we have here. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, let's say you're coming up with a drug that's going to help treat um, pneumonia, a drug that will help treat pneumonia. What organelles would you want to target uh, with this possible drug? Give you a minute to uh, give you a minute to think about it. All right. So there's actually a couple of ones that you can target right here. Uh, one of the things you can do is you can target the cilia. So if you get pneumonia right here, right, we got all this junk in our lungs. If we can bring that junk up, that's going to help us get rid of it, right? I don't care if I cough out the germs or if my immune system kills the germs, I'm going to get better, right? And so having that cilia that works is going to be a big help here. Uh, the other thing I could be targeting is the peroxisomes, right? So that hydrogen peroxide will allow my uh, cells to be able to kill tons and tons of germs. Another thing is the lysosomes. So the lysosomes will actually produce this really strong acid that will dissolve uh, the germs right there. All right, another question here. Your patient's on chemotherapy. Uh, and so this agent is supposed to uh, stop the cells from dividing. But it's causing a lot of side effects, numbness and tingling of the hands and feet, uh, numbness around the mouth, uh, maybe hallucinations or whatever. But, you know, you think to yourself, that's kind of odd because neurons don't divide. So how could this medication be causing uh, brain symptoms? What organelle would it be affecting? Give you a minute of time to think about it. Okay, so the answer is... Uh, it's going to be working on the cytoskeleton, and in particular, the uh, centrioles and centrosome, right? And so remember, your cytoskeleton, um, you know, these centrioles will split up, the centrosome will split up, and so these centrioles go to opposite sides of the cell and help that nucleus uh, divide, right? And so we're affecting the cytoskeleton, right? Uh, and that's how we're going to stop the cancer cells from replicating. Well, one of the things is with the neurons, that cytoskeleton is extremely important. Why? Because I got all these weirdo connections. I got to hold this pose exactly in order for you to be able to feel things or think and that sort of thing. Well, if my cytoskeleton is being messed up because I'm on chemo and, you know, out of nowhere, I'm, I'm kind of changing my pose here. I don't know. I'm losing a bunch of connections I shouldn't be having. And so I'm getting side effects uh, and so on. Okay. Um, all right, so here's another good question here. So cancer is a huge cause of death in America, right? Uh, it's the number two cause of death. We're looking at it being the number one cause of death. Um, and so a lot of times we're detecting cancers too late. Uh, by the time we've detected it, it's spread throughout the body and everything else. Um, so what if you had to give your patients radio active um, compound so something like radioactive sugar radioactive fat radioactive protein which of those would be best for locating cancers throughout the body would it be radioactive protein fat or sugar all right i'll give you a little bit of time to think about it 
are. So the correct answer is going to be radioactive fat. I'm sorry, radioactive sugar. Well, why radioactive sugar? Right. So one of the things is the mitochondria lets us suck energy out of our food, right? Well, guess what? Mitochondria also has a role in self-destruction, right? And so when your body develops cancer cells, most of the time they realize, hey, I'm turning cancerous, time to commit suicide. And so the cell will kill itself so we don't get cancer. Well, if you're cancer, that's not a good plan. And so a lot of times you get rid of those mitochondria. But without the mitochondria, you're going to have a hard time sucking energy out of your food, right? Um, and so you can't burn fat and you can't burn protein for energy. And so you have to rely on sugar. Then on top of that, instead of getting um, 34 ATP per glucose molecule, that's a measure of how much energy we're able to suck out of the sugar molecule. We're only able to suck 2 ATP out of the sugar molecule. So we're having to use at least 17 times the amount of sugar compared to what we were using before. Now, the Warburg effect says that we're using 19. Well, where did that extra uh, two times come from? Well, because we weren't using that uh, extra fat and protein right there. Um, and so, yeah, that's going to be a really good marker as to what's going on. All right. Um, now, well, what about protein? Wouldn't that be a good thing? Because the cancer cells are dividing and growing. Uh, and so growing things need a lot more protein. Yes, that is true. And so the problem with protein is it would go to any sort of cell that's rapidly growing right here. Um, and so your skin is rapidly growing, but doesn't mean you have cancer, right? Um, but the thing with the fat is because we don't have the mitochondria, we're using way more sugar than a normal non-cancer cell would use. Um, and so it can be very, very helpful. All right, um, let's see what you got right here. Okay, let's say you're coming up with a drug, um, and so this drug is supposed to help, uh, you know, tr uh, prevent men from getting women pregnant. So this is a birth control just for men. Which of these organelles would you want to target here? Give you a minute of time just to think about it. All right, so the answer is going to be that flagella right there. And so the flagella allow the sperm to swim up the female reproductive tract. Well, if the sperm just stays uh, where it was put, you know, there's no fertility there, right? The sperm has to be able to swim. And so medication that's going to shut down the flagella would be very, very powerful. And, you know, if that's the only thing we're shutting down, we're really not going to have that uh, many side effects. Why? Because our lungs don't have a flag uh, flagella in it. Uh, your arteries and veins and capillaries, right? There's no, as far as I know, there's no other part in our body that uses flagella other than the sperm, right? Now, the one uh, side effect that you could probably have is you might actually shut down the cilia. And the reason being is the cilia are a lot like the flagella. Um, you know, and so it would be pretty hard just to shut down the flagella without shutting down the cilia, right? Uh, and so if we shut those down, um, one of the problems that you can have is more likely to have pneumonia uh, because we're not moving that junk out of the lungs. Um, and so it's more likely to rot and get an infection and everything else. All right. Um, let's see if there's anything else that we could ask about on here. Okay, yeah, here's a good one. See if you're really paying attention. Um, you discover a new microorganism. And so this microorganism's DNA is neutral. It has, a, um, it has no charge. It's not positive. It's not negative. How would that change the chromatin to DNA ratio? How do you think that would change the chromatin to DNA ratio? Give you a minute of time to think about it. All right, so the answer is it would actually decrease the chromatin to DNA ratio. What the heck? How would I know that? All right, so remember how we were talking about how your DNA is negatively charged, right? And I can't have a bunch of negatives next to each other because negatives repel, right? So how do I pack down my DNA? Well, I have to have positive proteins. And so a positive plus a negative, it's going to be able to attract, and that will really be able to pack down, right? Um, and so what's going to happen is I need 
you know, a one-to-one -one ratio of that positive protein to my DNA, right? And so I'm going to have a chromatin to DNA ratio of at least two uh, in a normal person, right? Why? Because I need one histone, that's that positive protein, for pretty much every uh, DNA base. And so there's going to be a huge uh, amount of cro a huge amount of protein to DNA. And remember, protein plus DNA make up our chromatin. Going to that microorganism that didn't have negatively charged DNA, they're not going to need histones. Why? Because there's no charge. And so it's, I can pack them, stack them, and not worry about, oh, crap, they're, they're repelling. All right. And so that's how that would work. So, well, guys, I hope that helps. All right, that concludes today's episode. If you liked what you heard, be sure to click the subscribe and like button down below. And as always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or if there's any particular topic you'd like me to create a video on, let me know in the comments down below. All right, well, I look forward to seeing you on my next podcast.